Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Sarah Myhill, who is based in the UK. She has worked in NHS and private practice for 17 years and was the Honorable Secretary of the British Society for Ecological Medicine. Today, we're discussing her book, Diagnosis and Treatment of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Myalgic Encephalitis. Welcome to the the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So what inspired you to write about chronic fatigue? Okay, chronic fatigue syndrome is the worst treated condition in Western medicine today. And it's quite, it's quite clear to me from very early on that uh, it's, the doctors are treating it badly because they're not asking the right questions. Now, I've been in medical practice since 1981 and um, from very early on was interested in disease causation, whereas, as I'm sure you're aware, so much of Western medicine is all about symptom suppression with drugs. Um, They're not looking at the root causes of illness. Um, They want people to be taking medication for life. Why? Follow the money. And the fact of the matter is, with chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, it has a multiplicity of causes, and there is no simple pharmaceutical answer. Um, um, And therefore, um, the doctors who tend to, uh, say, look for symptom suppression aren't even tackling the causes of this problem. Well, you know, with my my own journey with with Lyme disease, chronic fatigue was uh, one of the first things I was diagnosed with, obviously. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's it and it seems with with talking to to my patients and my journey that this is not understood very well. I mean, I mean, what? Maybe you can explain to us what it is, and then let us know, kind of. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll start there. The the, the, the key point to remember is that chronic fatigue syndrome and ME is not a diagnosis it is a clinical picture and there are two elements to this now if I have somebody who has a pure chronic fatigue syndrome clinical picture that is characterized by poor energy delivery mechanisms and i.e. they have physical fatigue they have mental fatigue um, they have no stamina they have post-exertional malaise and many other symptoms Um, And that's all about energy delivery mechanisms. My special interest is mitochondria, and mitochondria are part of the poor energy delivery mechanisms. Now, in ME, they have all the chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms plus an inflammatory component. And inflammation is characterized by heat, redness, swelling, fever, um, you know, malaise, the symptom of being ill. So we then have to ask our Sells the question, what is causing that inflammation? And inflammation occurs when the immune system is activated, which may be like yourself, chronic infection, for example, Lyme disease, but I often see patients with chronic Epstein-Barr um, infection or chronic mycoplasma, but many other possibilities. Or the immune system may be um, alerted because of allergies. And I got into this whole area of medicine through my interest in allergies to foods, um, to uh, microbes, to um, uh, inhalants, and so on. So chronic fatigue syndrome, as I say, is just about energy delivery mechanisms. ME is poor energy delivery mechanisms plus inflammation. So, um, you know, my, with my experience, and I, I hear stories similar to this almost every day, yeah. Once I was diagnosed, there was um, n- nobody would even talk to me about anything anymore. Mm. You know, they 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 kind of said, well, you know, you have this, and and off you go, and yeah. just wanted me to kind of go on with my life. And um, you know, and and I did. I actually went to school, still being extremely fatigued. So I was told this is how I was going to be. But yeah, it, yeah. It, why why is it that that patients are are when you know they can't function and they can't get out of bed that they're just kind of disregarded and that way. It, it's absolutely shocking. This is one of the big scandals in medicine uh, as we speak. Um, and it, 
it boils down to the fact that doctors, they're not even asking the right questions. They're not even looking for the mechanisms by which fatigue results. And uh, because this does not come up in standard medical education, then their answer is, it's it blame the patient. It's somatization disorder. They're hypochondriacs. They're making the symptoms up. They're making themselves ill because they believe they're fatigued, i.e., these poor patients get shoveled into the psychiatric dustbin when they have clear physical disease. And, of course, your routine panel of medical tests like hematology, biochemistry, or whatever, won't pick up uh, the lesions that we see commonly in chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. So um, this, what you have described is is utterly appalling. It goes on all the time. And it's simply because the doctors are not asking the right questions and because they don't know what the questions are and they don't know what the answers are, they blame the patient. So it seems to me, and I I know this is with Lyme disease, and I'm wondering if it's the same with chronic fatigue, if if the the idea of it or the information for it needs to start with higher up than the doctors. I mean, I know with with Lyme, they're told by their governing body in almost every country (laughs) that, you know, this is not a thing and this is not a problem. And so is that the same with chronic fatigue where it's just more of a, a political thing happening and the doctors just need more education? Well, believe you me, I have been trying to educate doctors throughout the course of my clinical career, and they are deaf to uh, my approach, or our approach, because I'm sure yours is the same as mine. And they, I mean, medical education is not an education, it's a brainwashing. And these days, medical students are taught groups of symptoms, and these are the drugs you need to suppress the symptoms. They are not looking for causation. And this is why I'm writing the books, because what I'm finding is that if my patients are going to get better, I have to teach them how to do it themselves. And I have to give them the rules of the game, i.e. how to address energy delivery mechanisms, the the tools of the trade um, um, to, to address some of the inflammatory conditions so they can do it themselves, because there simply aren't enough good doctors who are educated in all these issues to deal with the multiplicity, the millions of patients that are out there suffering who need this information today. Well, so, um, you know, if this isn't widely recognized when you're trying to bring this information, how, how is that, um, how are you treated with that? How is that, that recognized? Well, by the medical profession, how they look at me. Yeah. Well, they think I'm a complete pariah. Uh, because I am um, practicing my medicine in an anti-establishment fashion. And in fact, um, in, in the, there was a window of time over 13 years where I was endlessly prosecuted by the General Medical Council following complaints from doctors. None of my patients have ever complained about my methods of treatment, but I always write to GPs, I always write to consultants to tell them what I'm doing, and uh, they didn't like what I was doing, and as a result, they referred me to the General Medical Council. Now, that is the body that overviews doctors um, in this country and gives them their license. Uh, and in fact, I faced 30 separate charges. Um, I had to defend myself because I couldn't afford um, a lawyer to do that for me. Um, and every single charge I rebutted. So the score is now uh, my hill 30, the General Medical Council zero. In fact, if you want to have a little giggle, I did a Freedom of Information Act search for the GMC, and I'm the most investigated doctor in the history of the General Medical Council. Now, that illustrates the establishment bias against doctors like me, against doctors like you, who are using um, ecological medicine effectively, i.e. simple dietary, nutritional, herbal, and yes, maybe antibiotic regimes to treat patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, because all these complaints um, revolved around this subject. Well, so, I, 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 and, you know, when I, I read that in your book, although I wasn't very surprised, I'm still, there is still a, a part of me that just wonders what is going on in their heads when, when they're doing this, when you're just trying to help your patients. And, and there, there was a comment that in your book, and you could correct me if I'm getting this wrong, there's a, a quote that, you know, the main concern was that your patients were actually getting better. I know. 
I know. I mean, that, I have to say that absolutely blew me away. Um, that was came from a barrister who was um, um, an independent barrister who was asked to advise the GMC in their progression of their cases against me. Um, it seems that the patients count for nothing. Uh, it's uh, that was the only conclusion I could come to, and. Again, I so often uh, have contact with doctors or I write to doctors and they don't seem to care about the patients. Now, um, I don't say I know all the answers, but what I do know is I do know what the questions are and I do care about my patients. And those patients who don't get well um, with the intervention I'm putting in place, it means I'm missing something and that inspires me to go and look elsewhere for ideas, uh, to ask my colleagues to look through the medical literature and very often if you're asking the right questions, then you see an answer. And not only do you move that patient on, you'll help many others who are going to get stuck at the same point. So um, it has been a, a very interesting journey of discovery. And yes, um, some doctors um, have behaved very, very badly in this respect. Well, you know, I, I think that most of most patients with chronic fatigue do feel like they don't matter to their doctors. You know, they often will um, look for help elsewhere, but then feel like they can't tell their doctor that they're doing so because they're they'll be shamed into it. And and you know, there there's. Um, some people that go through it like a chronic fatigue test and they tell me they push their self, themselves through it but they didn't function for three days but they passed that test and so then they have to go back to work and this bigger picture of their quality of life is yeah. in isn't you know being looked at yeah. and and, and uh, you know it, it's it's very sad because most people do want to go back to work and they do want to participate in their families and and they're just told that that's not what they want to do and so of course you know I mean this is this is not sad this is criminal in my view and in fact you may be aware that um, in 2011 um, there was a study published in the Lancet called the PACE study now this was government funded to the tune of five million pounds and a group of psychiatrists led by Professor Peter White of um, a, a big London hospital set up a study to look at um, the effectiveness of graded exercise therapy in the treatment of people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, uh, anybody who knows anything about the disease will know that this is an oxymoron because chronic fatigue syndrome is defined by exercise intolerance. And therefore, to exercise these patients is bound to make them worse. But these psychiatrists wanted to set up this study in order to demonstrate that chronic fatigue syndrome was a psychological condition. Now, as they got into the study with these patients, they realized it wasn't working. And in fact, many of the patients were being made worse. So what did they do? They moved the goalposts. They changed the study. They fudged it in such a way as to get a good outcome. Now, this is not not me that's saying this. This is um, doctors from academic bodies all over the world who looked at the PACE complaint, um, looked at how the study was done, um, uh, and, then and then did a critique of uh, that actual study. In fact, in order to be able to do a critique, they had to get the raw material from the PACE authors. When they asked for the raw data, it was refused, and therefore they had to go to a, um, an information tribunal. The PACE authors tried to withhold that information, and they spent £200,000 on legal fees to do that. But eventually the tribunal um, determined in favor of those requesting the information. So having got the raw data, it was then reanalyzed properly using proper statistics, and they found that uh, grade exercise is completely ineffective in treating patients with ME. Now, that is scientific fraud, and... On the basis of that, I have reported the authors of the PACE study to the General Medical Council because not only is it scientific fraud, it's also financial fraud. They have used public money to set up a fraudulent study. And as we speak, the General Medical Council is considering that complaint. They're deciding whether or not they are going to investigate. But it would be shameful if they refused to investigate. Well, I mean, this is years later, and I know that, that the PACE study has set up a lot of people for 
not getting the help that they need because, you know, they're told to, to do graduated exercise and to go home. And of course, they can't do that. And they're not getting the support they need to get their energy back. So then they're stuck in this vicious cycle. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And um, um, we've obviously this complaint, we have um, uh, made it clear through Facebook that this is what's going on. And we've now had over 200 patients have written to the GMC to state that not only have they been made worse by graded exercise, but as a result of the PACE study, benefits have been withheld, pension rights have been withheld, and referral to proper medical therapy has been refused. In addition to that, we now have uh, um, uh, question um, um, a petition online and over 7,000 people have signed that again people who have been made worse by pace so this is a very big deal and I hope it will be a proper wake up call to conventional doctors medical doctors to really start looking at the causes of ME not trying to wish it away with graded exercise and CBT which are irrelevant to the causes of chronic fatigue syndrome and ME I definitely agree with you there. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Dr. Sarah Myhill, and we'll be back shortly. The future of online TV is here. View exclusive content from your favorite talk radio hosts and new programs that you can't see anywhere else. Visit voiceamerica.tv today. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294- 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Is email an important part of your business? It is for us. That's why Voice America partners with MailJet. MailJet lets us create impactful newsletters and deliver them right to the inbox fast. Microsoft, MIT, and Avis trust MailJet for their emailing, and so should you. Go to MailJet.com and use the promo code VOICEAMERICA to start emailing for free today. Find out what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Dr. Sarah Myhill, and we're discussing her book, The Diagnosis and Treatment of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Myalgic Encephalitis. So, Dr. Myhill, um, w- with chronic fatigue, I mean, you did say it, it is a syndrome, which I think is important to point out, and you said it was a bigger picture of what's going on. But th- is there any sort of test to see, um, you know, how much fatigue someone has or if they even have this? Well, um um, of course, the problem with the symptom of fatigue is that it is a subjective symptom. Uh, and just like you can't test for pain and you can't test for depression very well, it's difficult to test directly for fatigue. But fatigue results um, from the sum total of um, diet, mitochondria, thyroid, and adrenal function. 
And it's those four things that are involved in energy delivery mechanisms. And a very useful analogy I use is the diet um, is the fuel in your tank. The mitochondria are the engine of your car. The thyroid gland is the accelerator pedal. And the gearbox is the adrenal gland. And, of course, it's attention to all those four issues um, that are critical for energy delivery mechanisms. But in about all the early 2000s, I got interested in the idea that mitochondria, i.e. the engine of the car of patients with fatigue syndrome, is an important player. Now, I work very closely with a biochemist uh, called Dr. John McLaren Howard, and he is um, the most brilliant biochemist I've ever come across. He um, set up Biolab Laboratories in the early 1980s, um, and whilst he was working at Biolab, we collaborated in a test for mitochondrial function. Um, And um, thanks to his brilliance, he came up with a test that looks at how mitochondria work. Now, what mitochondria do is they generate the energy. They take the fuel from the bloodstream, which is acetate groups, and that may come from ketones or from fat or from carbohydrates. They burn acetates in the presence of oxygen to generate the fuel ATP. And he looked at various um, aspects of that process and came up with a very useful mitochondrial function test. Now, we can score those tests by measuring the various parameters. And to cut a very long story short, um, I had about 70 patients who weren't improving as a result of diet, thyroid, um, uh, adrenal, and and tackling all things that I knew to tackle at the time. And um, between us, um, I agreed an energy score, a clinical energy score with that patient. We then did blood tests and sent the bloods down to Biolab so that they could uh, do the mitochondrial function tests. And the results of that test then went to an independent researcher, Dr. Norman Booth from Oxford University. And he scored the mitochondrial function test from the results from Acumen. And what's so interesting is that those patients who were the most fatigued had the worst mitochondrial function scores and vice versa. And we published this in the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Medicine in 2009. And that was the first very solid bit of evidence that mitochondria are central players in patients with fatigue syndromes. Broadly speaking, mitochondria can go slow for one of two reasons. They can go slow because they are lacking the raw materials to to allow them to work properly. And in the book, I detail um, the five common rate-limiting steps and what you need to fix them. So D-ribose is the raw material to make ATP. Magnesium is an essential part of mitochondrial function. Without coenzyme Q10, the res- mitochondrial respiratory enzymes can't work efficiently. You need carnitine in order to shuttle um, acetate groups into mitochondria where they um, work as a fuel. And vitamin B3 is, a, is an essential intermediary. So they are the five common deficiencies that come up time and time and time again for why mitochondria are going slow. Or they may be going slow because they're blocked by something. And they may be blocked by um, chemicals, toxins. And I got interested in chronic fatigue syndrome early on because I saw many farmers with sheep dip flu who'd been poisoned by organophosphates. And organophosphates inhibit oxidative phosphorylation for very obvious biochemical reasons. But equally, I saw many other patients, um, and their mitochondria were going slow because they were being inhibited by other chemicals. So 9-11 firemen, for example, who were being poisoned from burning products, sick building syndrome, they were being poisoned from toxins within um, the house. But increasingly, I'm seeing patients who are being poisoned by products of the fermenting gut, and this is another area of interest. So the point about the mitochondrial function test that we do is um, um, they tell us if they're going slow, and why they're going slow, and they're a useful, objective measure of fatigue. Now, as I understand it, this is the only test in the world that is such an objective measure of fatigue. And as a result of that, that has been very helpful to, um, for my patients getting their benefits and their pensions because it's very hard for doctors to argue with an objective test of fatigue, which has been uh, properly proven. We are working very hard to try and find other laboratories um, who can do this test, um, and they are slowly coming forward. But at m- the moment, we just have this one lab that does this test. So, I, I mean, it, it, that I'm guessing that lab is in the UK. Yes, that's in the UK. 
but there's a test, uh, there's a laboratory in Germany who's starting to do these tests. Um, I've also in conversations with Oxford University. It's just possible they may be able to do these tests, but that's all very much in the pipeline. Well, you know, it's really encouraging that, that this is going on because I, the reason why I want to bring all this information that I do on this show is so that people don't have to spend 14 years like I did to find out what's going on. Yeah, and I, I agree. It, I agree. Yeah. But again, the important thing is, is that even without that test, in the book, I detail exactly the supplements you need to take to improve mitochondria and also how one can do tests for toxicity um, to identify what what may be blocking mitochondria and how that can be treated. So all these interventions that I'm recommending, anybody can do them. You don't need a doctor. You can access the labs directly, maybe with the help of a nutritional therapist or somebody with, uh, with some training. But this is all stuff that people can do themselves at home without incurring major expense and without having to get the medical profession involved. Um, well, yeah, thank you for, for doing that. It's it, it's encouraging that um, hopefully this will change at some point. And I know, you know, in, in Canada, it's not something that, that we talk about here, um, but we, we'll catch up at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're if you're tired, you should just you know get up and do something. Um, well, well, that just masks the symptom. That doesn't uh, address the root cause. I mean, the two subjects that I probably talk more about than all other subjects put together is diet and sleep. Uh, and you know, really, what you have to do with those is non-negotiable. You've absolutely got to get the diet right, and if you don't get the right quantity of sleep and the right quality of sleep then you can forget everything else. But believe you me, most conventionally trained doctors rarely ask about sleep and rarely ask about diet. So they're missing major um, uh, treatment uh, modalities straight away. Well, you know, and, and it seems that, that they don't talk about diet at all, which I think I find that very interesting because, um, you know, I once was looking at books for this show and I found that nine out of ten were about diet. So, so there's a high need out there for people who want to make themselves feel better, because um, a lot of those diets aren't for weight loss. They're actually for inflammation and autoimmunity and, you know, longevity. But, but most people are looking for a way to feel better, and they're not yeah. getting that from their doctor. They're getting here's a prescription, off you Correct. go, right? They're not getting listened to. They're not getting the help they need, and then they're having to do that on their own. Like you said, that's why you wrote the book so that they can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is absolutely right. But um, you know, I rather assume that that approach arose in this country because we have a, na- a national health service in this country. And what that means is that treatments are physician-led. So the doctors lay out their shop and say, this is what's available. If you don't like it, go away. Whereas I always got the impression in America that it's more patient-led. So the patients, they they want a particular service, whatever that may be, and they at least have the opportunity to see different doctors until they find one that is going to actually address their needs rather than um, one that says, you know, take it or leave it. Well, and, and, you know, here you can't even get a referral to one of those doctors unless you meet certain criteria. Um, And uh, and then you're just stuck with, you know, a family doctor that says your blood, I mean, it's not always their fault, your blood work or your tests don't match. And so you can't see a specialist. And so, you know, there's nothing they can do for you, Um, which, you know, if we bring in the mitochondria Mm -hmm. test that and people get a chronic fatigue test then somebody will be able to help them yeah yeah that that would be very helpful i i agree but at the moment um um we're still working on developing a, a test that would um uh that would is, is easy to do because the the test that the mitochondrial function test is technically a very difficult test to do that's why you need a brilliant biochemist um, in order to put it in place and um, it's time consuming it's difficult uh, but it just yields fantastic results well that's amazing um, so can you just walk us through what a typical case study would look like and, and what you would go about doing to help that person okay okay well um, um, uh, a typical case uh, you, what you have to do is you have to listen to the symptoms because to look at the person they may look superficially pretty normal. Uh, there's 
you know, they're not particularly. They're, they're okay. They're, they're they're obviously fatigued, but to look at, they don't have any of the any you know um, um, rashes or um, um, you know any obvious pathology. Um, 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 most people look fairly normal, but the symptoms are what give the uh, the diagnosis away because it's a clinical picture of severe physical fatigue. So these people they cannot work. Um, whatever, all activities have to be very carefully paced. If they overdo things, then they pay for it the next day, and we call that post-exertional malaise. They're, again, the brain is enormously demanding of energy, and um, although the brain weighs two percent of body weight, it consumes twenty percent of uh, um, of the fuel of the of the energy of the body. And if energy delivery is poor, then they have foggy brain. So their memory is appalling. They cannot. Um, uh, problem solved, they cannot think clearly, um, uh, they get everything into a muddle. Uh, for example, I had one patient who couldn't uh, watch, they couldn't, she couldn't watch a film or, or read a book because um, she forgot what had just gone before. Yes, um, I, I and was, as I a result like that, of that, the, it, with, when you've got poor energy delivery mechanisms, um, the brain is desperately trying to conserve energy. And so it gives the symptoms like anxiety, like depression, like intolerance of stress. And those are all mechanisms to stop us spending energy because the brain's in energy conservation mode because it knows it doesn't have the energy um, to perform normally. And in fact... Uh, Part of the energy equation, which always uh, impresses me, is that about two-thirds of all our energy just goes into staying alive, keeping warm, basic heart, basic brain, basic liver function. And um, um, so if energy delivery is impaired, the first thing that happens is we become physically fatigued and become mentally fatigued. So those are the two key symptoms. Now, if energy delivery to the heart is poor, and of course it is in patients with fatigue syndromes, then the heart cannot beat powerfully as a pump. And therefore, cardiac output is not maintained, and that will cause low blood pressure and what we call postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's much easier to pump blood when you're horizontal than when you're vertical. It's less work. So my ME patients and my chronic fatigue syndrome patients often only feel well when they're lying flat because that's when they can um, pump the blood around their body. As soon as they sit up, they haven't the, the heart cannot increase its output sufficiently to, to deal with that and they get acute low blood pressure and the heart races and we call that postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Now, a similar explanation um, um, uh, accounts for the temperature intolerance that people tell me they have. Very often, my chronic fatigue syndrome ME patients, they don't tolerate the heat, they don't tolerate the cold. They don't tolerate the cold because they don't have the energy delivery mechanisms to keep warm. And they don't tolerate the heat because in order to lose heat, you have to pump more blood to the skin in order that you can radiate it from the skin. To do that, the heart has to increase its output by about 20%. And if you've got poor energy delivery to the heart, it can't do that. So these patients, they hate the heart, they hate the cold, they can't tolerate either. Another symptom they often complain of is they don't like bright light and they don't like noise. Why? Because the business of processing that, the business of converting um, a light signal at the back of the eye to something that the brain can see requires a vast amount of energy. And they simply don't have the energy to do that. So their visual processing is very slow. So they can't read books. They can't watch television. That's the, the severely afflicted patients. Of course, in very severe cases, then they will go into organ failure because they don't have the energy for their organs to survive. And many of my chronic fatigue syndrome patients complain of chest pain. Now, that chest pain results because if the energy demand is greater than delivery, the body will switch into anaerobic metabolism. That's metabolism without oxygen. What does that do? You produce lactic acid. What is lactic acid? It's painful. You know, you ask any athlete, if you try and sprint 400 meters, well, you can't do it. Why? Because of the pain in your legs, the heaviness in the legs, the lactic acid burn in the legs. My ME patients get that when they walk 10 meters, let alone try and sprint. But you also get lactic acid burn in the heart for the same reason. Heart metabolism switches into anaerobic metabolism. It produces lactic acid. What is lactic acid burn in the heart? It's angina. So my patients complain of heart pain, which is angina. 
Now, it's not the classical angina that cardiologists describe, which occurs through poor blood supply. If it's poor blood supply because the arteries are narrowed, then yes, you get the angina with exercise. You stop and you rest, and um, normal metabolism restores as the, as, the, as the blood flow catches up. But with the ME patients, they don't have the energy to stop that lactic acid burn. They don't have the energy to convert that lactic acid back to uh, pyruvate or to acetate again. And therefore, it's very persistent. So it, it's not the classical clinical picture of angina due to poor blood supply, but be no doubt at all, it is angina. And again, it's a, it's a lovely illustration of the severity of the pathology of patients with severe chronic fatigue syndromes and, M or, and or ME. Oh, perfect. Thank you for that. We're going to talk more about it when we get back. We're talking today with Dr. Sarah Myhill. We'll be back shortly. The future of online TV is here. View exclusive content from your favorite talk radio hosts and new programs that you can't see anywhere else. Visit voiceamerica.tv today. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294- 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Is email an important part of your business? It is for us. That's why Voice America partners with MailJet. MailJet lets us create impactful newsletters and deliver them right to the inbox fast. Microsoft, MIT, and Avis trust MailJet for their emailing, and so should you. Go to MailJet.com and use the promo code VOICEAMERICA to start emailing for free today. Find out what's happening on the Voice America Talk Radio Network by keeping up with us on Twitter. You can find us at Voice America TRN. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Dr. Sarah Myhill, and we're discussing her book, Diagnosis and Treatment of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Myalgic Encephalitis. So, um, Dr. Myhill, you just explained to us what uh, chronic fatigue looks like. And in your book, you lay out um, a plan of what people can do to get better. So what would that look like? Okay. I I think of this as a roadmap. (laughs) And um, chronic fatigue, the symptom of chronic fatigue arises when energy demand exceeds energy delivery. So we have to look at both sides of those equations. We have to look at how the body is generating energy, and we have to look at how the body is spending energy. Now, on the energy generation side, there are four important players. There is the fuel that goes in the tank, i.e. the diet. There's the mitochondrial engine that we've discussed. Then there's the thyroid accelerator pedal. And then there's the adrenal gearbox. In addition to that, we then have servicing and repair, and that is good quality sleep. So that's all the energy delivery mechanism issues. And then we have to look at how energy is expended. And this is a particular problem for my patients who have ME because they are spending energy on their immune system. 
The immune system is like the brain. It's enormously demanding of energy. And the immune system likes to run on fat because that's a very dense energy source. But if the immune system is busy because um, it's fighting in chronic infection or because um, it's spending energy uselessly on allergy, then we have to look at that inflammatory hole in the energy bucket, as I describe it. So that is the overall view. And you can often get good clues from the history. So patients whose chronic fatigue syndrome has been triggered by a nasty infection, and of course that is the case for you, then um, you want to go down the infectious uh, pathway and look at um, the the, the possible issues. A very common trigger, as we mentioned earlier, is Epstein-Barr virus. And uh, you may be aware of the work of Dr. Martin Lerner, who demonstrated that about um, Epstein-Barr virus is causal in about 80% of patients with a post-viral chronic fatigue syndrome. You've highlighted the issue of Lyme disease, which, of course, you know, if the immune system is busy fighting Lyme, that is going to kick a big hole in the energy bucket, and fatigue is a common presenting symptom. But there will also be symptoms of inflammation, and as I'm sure you know, um, uh, Lyme can get, the spirochy can get into any part of the body, uh, so you can get neurological Lyme, um, as well as more systemic uh, manifestations. Um, But again, chronic mycoplasma, I seem to see a lot of chronic mycoplasma infections, now, we have a, we're very fortunate in this country to, um, uh, to have access to a laboratory in Germany uh, called Armin Laboratories who do reliable tests for those infections. So that would give us a very good clue. And if we came up with a strong positive, then one would be very tempted um, to go down that route. But I always start with the energy delivery mechanisms. Why? Because if you can improve the energy delivery mechanisms, you then give your immune system more energy. Now, think of the immune system as an army. Now, what do armies need? They need a lot of energy to power them, and they need the raw materials, you know, the ammunition with which to fight um, infection and invaders. So by starting off with improving energy delivery mechanisms, you're also addressing what I call the immunological hole in the energy bucket. So that's the kind of overview of the whole thing. But I, uh, the, what then people want to know is, well, what am I actually going to do? How do I go about that in practical reality? And my approach to treating uh, CFSME is now very standard, so much so that if you get the book, read it and go through it, you will get yourself an awful long way there. And as I mentioned earlier, there are two things that are non-negotiable, the diet and the sleep. And of course, they're linked. And um, I spend an awful lot of time talking about them. But I now know that the starting point is the paleo ketogenic diet. Paleo, because we want to avoid the major allergens, i.e. gluten grains, dairy products, and yeast. And, of course, they are ubiquitously present in Western diets, in um, uh, U.S. diets as well as U.K. diets. And secondly, ketogenic, because... Uh, A ketogenic diet is a very low-carbohydrate diet. And if you think about it, the paleo-ketogenic diet is the evolutionary correct diet. This is the diet that primitive man evolved with and our gut and our whole metabolism is geared to running with. Now, primitive man obviously evolved um, in Africa and then migrated um, uh, to the north. And when he migrated north, he had to deal with winter. And the body, the human body, learned a very useful trick. It learned to be able to fuel itself with carbohydrates because by fueling itself with carbohydrates, you could take advantage of the autumn bonanza because in autumn, we have a natural harvest. We have honey, we have fruit trees, we have grains, we have root vegetables, we have pulses, and all those foods primitive man would have eaten. And in eating them, he would have temporarily developed metabolic syndrome and he would have got fat. And of course, fat is important survival value for the winter. Why? It keeps you warm and it's a fuel source. But primitive man would have run out of um, carbohydrates simply because the harvests were no longer there. And so through necessity, he would have gone back to a ketogenic diet, a hunting diet based on meat and fat, and that would have sustained him for the whole of the rest of the year. Now, for man to be persuaded to eat carbohydrates, that's when addiction comes in. And addiction is the tool, if you like, that nature gave us to make us feast um, um, on carbohydrates and get fat because that 
affords evolutionary benefit. But of course, running, eating carbohydrates is potentially dangerous because infections, for example, can only survive, bacteria and yeast can only survive on sugars and carbohydrates. They can't survive on, um, on fat. So that window of time may have made us more susceptible to infection, but it was a price worth paying because it afforded survival value for the winter. But because those carbohydrate foods are so addictive and because we are so clever and we have um, a fuel supply now that means that we live in permanent autumn, we can access carbohydrate foods throughout the year, we never stop eating them. And um, furthermore, we have been subject to very poor nutritional advice, which uh, recommends carbohydrates as being staple foods and fats as being dangerous foods. And we now know that is completely wrong. It's completely upside down. Fat, um, saturated fats and oils are very safe foods and uh, human metabolism is perfectly geared to deal with them and to cope with them and to use them as a fuel. It's carbohydrates that are the danger fuels. And therefore, the starting point is the paleo-ketogenic diet. So um, another thing you talk about in your book um, is the environmental part. Now, is there a way or what, like what should people be looking for to make their environment safe for them? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, um, uh, we live in a, in a, a nasty, toxic, polluted world. And um, even doing the very best you possibly can, um, we, we, we all um, are polluted and it's, these pollutants in the air, things like pesticide residues in foods, things like toxic metals from dental amalgam fillings, from um, aluminium used in cooking, uh, from aluminium deodorants, um, volatile organic compounds um, such as perfumes, cleaning agents, bleaches, they all poisonous. And it's a little bit like throwing a handful of sand into a finely tuned engine. It just accelerates the aging process, um, sticks onto DNA, sticks onto mitochondria, and makes them go slow. So doing a good environmental cleanup is often very helpful. Um, and um, the worst offenders are things that are in our normal house, things like air fresheners, um, cleaning agents, um, cosmetics, deodorants. Uh, all these things have the potential uh, to poison us. And so doing a good chemical cleanup is also an important part of um, recovering from chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. It's also an important part of not getting any other nasty diseases because many of these things are associated with, um, uh, with, with chronic disease. For example, hair dyes. Uh, most hair dyes um, are, um, contain chemicals that are known carcinogens and they're absorbed very well through the skin. Uh, one example of this is that hairdressers have a greatly increased risk of bladder cancer. Why? Because they're dealing with hair dyes all the time. They absorb them very well through the skin and through inhalation, and they're excreted in the, in the kidneys and the bladder, which irritates it and causes cancer. So just look in your own backyard um, um, and within your own house to do a good chemical cleanup. And the key here is if you can smell it, then it's in the brain, it's in the body. Well, you know, it, um, I'm quite sensitive to chemicals. It's a big part of my story. And I'm still shocked that there is so much of it out there. And it's, um, I think, taboo to not want to wear perfume or not want, you know, mm. certain things in your environment. I agree. Um, it's, a- it's absolutely shocking. And in, in fact, one of the, the worst poison patients I saw was a lady who was working as a florist. Now, in uh, um, in UK, most flowers are grown overseas and flown in, and um, all the pesticides that are often banned in foods are allowed for flowers, and these are some very toxic chemicals indeed, and she was handling these flowers every day, and these chemicals are well absorbed through inhalation, they're well absorbed through the skin, and she had extremely high levels of organophosphate in her fat. Uh, it, it wasn't that she was eating the flowers, she was simply absorbing the chemical through her skin. You're probably aware in this country, um, we had an incident recently of um, um, Russian spies being poisoned by an organophosphate chemical. And um, all that happened, it was, it was painted on the front door of his, his house. And he touched the front door, his door touched the front door, and that was enough to jolly nearly kill them. So it's a beautiful example of how chemicals are well absorbed through the skin and can have devastating effects. 
Well, and and are still not regulated properly and um, are, you know, everywhere. Yeah, they're ubiquitous. It's impossible to avoid them completely. And I do fat biopsies to look for uh, loads of chemical loads of pesticides and volatile organic compounds. I have never done a normal fat biopsy. We always find um, a background chemical load there. And my view is that we should all be doing some sort of detox regime to try to keep that load to a minimum. And I detail those um, uh, on the website. But um, the best, the, the, the regime I use essentially just heating regimes because anything that heats you up will mobilize these chemicals from the subcutaneous fat onto the fatty layer on the surface of the skin and they can then be washed off. And roughly speaking, uh, and you can do that either by saunering or sunbathing or a hot bath with Epsom salts in that or a Turkish bath or if you've got the energy, just running will, will heat, warm up the body, mobilize these chemicals onto the surface of the skin and you then wash them off. And a rough rule of thumb is that about 50 heating regimes will reduce the body load by about a half. And, um, um, and if you do another 50, then that reduces it by another half. So these chemicals come out exponentially. Now, you never get every last molecule out, but thankfully the body can cope with a bit of background um, chemical toxic stress, um, and, um, and, and that's, uh, that's, what, that's the best that we can aim for. Well, I I don't think there's any safe place because outside we have pollution and, and pesticides and inside we have the chemicals in our home and our perfumes and all that kind of stuff. So it seems like it's more we need to get this regulated so people are safer. We need to get our own environment safe and, and clean. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. And funny enough, I just today I had a patient with severe multiple chemical sensitivity with these very problems. I mean, she can't go out um, um, because she uh, gets allergic reactions to traffic fumes. Um, uh, she has to eat organic food. She has to live in a very safe environment. It's like being a... She's, a prisoner in her own home she doesn't have a life because the, the you know the outside world is so polluted and one cannot it's impossible to avoid exposures um uh, these days um well uh, is there any way if somebody wants more information that they can get a hold of you or your book Yes, all my information is freely available on my website. If you Google drmyhill.co.uk, it comes up and uh, all my stuff is there. Um, anybody can help themselves too. Um, and I've obviously been writing the books recently to put into a more coherent uh, form. And Chelsea Green, bless them, have been publishing the books and they are now available in the USA. So well, the see- Chelsea Green website, you should be able to access these books. Well, that's perfect. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. This was a great show. My pleasure. You're obviously asking all the right questions, and you're obviously immersed in this subject. So thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you so much. Today we are talking with Dr. Sarah Myhill. We're discussing her book, Diagnosis and Treatment of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Myalgic Encephalitis. And even if you don't have a diagnosis, if you are suffering from any chronic illness, this book can definitely help you get on your path to wellness. Um, So I want to thank everybody for listening today and be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.